So, dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity to, to think about you and remind ourselves who you are, remind ourselves your nature by means of your word and your history and your, your actions throughout Israel. We pray right now for Israel, and we just thank you for this time. Bless this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be continuing on with Second Kings chapter 18. Uh, this is a fairly pretty well-known story. It's focusing on King Hezekiah. Hezekiah is rare among kings of Judah because he's highly praised, um, praised as as highly as David. <clears throat> um, there's the only king that they speak. Only king that has more more copy, more narrative is King Solomon in first second Kings. And as you recall, last week, chapter 17 was the demise and fall of the northern kingdom, Israel. Last king taken away, and judgment finally culminating on the northern kingdom, which of course makes the rest of Second Kings easier because now there's only one country to go, to keep track of. Everything now is, is Judah from here on out. And so in 2 Kings chapter 18, it says, It came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Hosea is the last king of the northern kingdom. <clears throat> so they're just putting a timeline here. And now we're talking about Hezekiah. 25 years old old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. So people try to crunch some of these numbers, you know, this, this reign and that reign, how many years, and there's some problems because there's unknown co-regency. Sometimes a father and son will reign at the same time. Hezekiah apparently reigned with Ahaz for about 14 years. Um, from 729 to 715. And the third year of Hosea is when Hezekiah is said to have begun reigning. Um, he would reign for about 18 years on his own, and then his son Manasseh, he reigned with him together. So there's a total of about 29 years for Hezekiah and the co-regency. What's impressive about Hezekiah is he's the son of Ahaz. Ahaz probably was the most wicked king of Judah. And <clears throat> amazingly, Hezekiah comes out and becomes one of the best kings of Judah. Hezekiah said he did right as David. Only other kings in the Bible that are compared to David like that was Asa back in 1 Kings 15, and in Chronicles 17, Jehoshaphat, and coming up in 2 Kings 22, Josiah. <clears throat> so, Hezekiah being raised and even reigned with a very wicked, wicked father. But he had a mother, his name is mentioned here, who probably had a lot to do with that. And also we'll see that Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, was someone that Hezekiah worked with. And Isaiah, you know, led him and helped him follow God and do things in a godly manner. Also... Hezekiah got to watch as the northern kingdom was destroyed. And like anybody who sees their older sibling punished, he may have said, it's time to behave, try to do things the right way. And that's what he did. He did something very special in verse 3, that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, did. He removed the high places. If you remember, all along, even the supposed good kings ignored the high places. That means that they might have gotten rid of the big idols and then gotten rid of some of the um, the idolatrous temples. But out in the mountainsides, they let people continue having their shrines and their other ways to worship God or worship other gods. And here, Hezekiah is the first one to come along and just wipe that out too. Completely get rid of all the idolatry, the false idols. He cut down the groves and he broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. So I know if you go back to 
Numbers 21, we had the story about the brazen serpents. Israelites were complaining, and God gave them something to complain about. Fiery serpents went into the camp. It bit people, and the, the you know, it burnt like with acid fire, and they were dying, and they asked Moses to help, and Moses made a brass serpent, put up on a pole, and told people, if you look at it, you'll be healed. And of course, Jesus refers to that in his dissertation or conversation with Nicodemus in John 3, 14 to 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is the, the picture of, of faith. And I, I can always imagine people in Moses' camp who've been bit, their legs are burning, they're short of breath, and someone says, hey, if you look over there, there's a big brass snake on a pole 50 feet up in the air. You look at it and you'll live, and a person will say, that's stupid. I'm not going to do that. That doesn't make any sense. And of course, the question that people I like to ask is, why would a brass serpent be used to represent Jesus Christ? And of course, the answer is Christ became sin for us. And the serpent represented sin. The brass represents judgment. But what's interesting is that the question you may have asked is, well, whatever happened to that brass serpent? Well, it turns out they were carrying it around as an icon, a religious relic. And by the time of Hezekiah here, people were worshiping it just as another idol. And it says here, unto those days, in the verse 4, into those days, the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and they called it Nehushtan. Someone says Nehushtan, I feel like saying Gesundheit, but Nehushtan really means piece of brass. Just, it was a chunk of brass. They were worshiping a piece of, well, brass is pretty high technology, so maybe that's why they're worshiping it. Anyway, people will find anything that has some sort of meaning and give it meaning that it shouldn't have, whether it's nostalgia or tradition. And as a Kai, to his credit, was getting rid of anything that was replacing God. <clears throat> Verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah or that were before him. Well, he's, he's the best of the best since David because he claved to the Lord. He stuck to the Lord. This was special. David was famous because he had a heart after God. Solomon in all his glory and splendor did not have that, did not have the relationship. Hezekiah here, he has a similar relationship. It says, he departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. This is God prospering a person who is honoring the Mosaic Covenant. He prospered him with us wherever he went forth. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. So, if you recall, the king of Assyria had been shutting down the northern kingdom, and he was eyeing the southern kingdom. And at this point, he, he just holds them off. No tribute, just back off. Hezekiah saw the Philistines up into Gaza and the borders thereof from the Tower of the Watchmen to the fenced city. Um, this phrase, from the Tower to the Watchmen, means whatever way he turned. Every direction Hezekiah went, he was successful militarily, successful economically, he prospered. And it came to pass in the fourth year of the King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalomans, their king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. So this is a recap of last, of uh, chapter 17. Assyria, they, they've made advances to Judah. Hezekiah pushed them away. They make advances into the northern kingdom, and they're going to conquer them. At the end of the three years, verse 10, they took it, which was the sixth year of Hezekiah, the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel. Samaria, Samaria was taken. And the king of Assyria did carry Israel into Assyria and put them in Hala and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. Again, the same list as last chapter. 
And verse 12 gives us the reason. Because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant. And all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, and would not hear them nor do them. So this is a little subtle warning to the southern kingdom. But Hezekiah is not doing that. He's doing everything right and gotten rid of all the idols, built up the temple, honoring the high priest, and doing, doing what, what, what God has asked him to do. Now, verse 13. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against the fantasies of Judah and took them. This is a big jump here. Sennacherib is the son of the Assyrian king. This is the son of um, of uh, Shalomanser. And he's he's got the idea here is that his dad took out the northern kingdom. He was trying to try take out the southern kingdom. And he just comes in. He starts taking out cities. I mean, in secular history, we have the king just going down walled cities and, and taking them out. And Hezekiah is, is very upset by this. <clears throat> It says, I wanted to go back here where it said that um, he rebelled. In verse 7, this is Hezekiah rebelling against Assyria. When is rebelling against somebody okay and not okay? This rebellion here is because he's fighting against uh, an illegitimate oppressor. Uh, later on in Judah's history, Zedekiah is going to be charged to not rebel against King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Because in that case, Nebuchadnezzar has been announced by Jeremiah and, and, and Isaiah that they are, God's raised them up to punish. God's raised them up to judge. And so when God is legitimately judging, you take your punishment, you, you, you accept it, you submit to it. In this case here, king of Assyria is a foreign aggressor, has no legitimacy at all. And so rebelling against illegitimate authority is perfectly biblical. We submit to legitimate authority and we, we rebel against Ill illegitimate authority. We don't acknowledge it. And that's something that as a church, we have to be discerning about, you know, who has the authority to tell us what to do, the state. Um, do we accept judgment? Do we accept situations? That's, that's something that different churches have to answer personally and prayerfully. <clears throat> so, but now we have a new king, 14th year. The new Assyrian king comes and he starts taking things out. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish. So as the Assyrian king is taking town after town in Judah, uh, finally, he's down in Lachish. Lachish is a, a fortress city in Judah. It's about 30 miles southwest of Jerusalem. And Hezekiah is watching this happen. And yes, it's a bad thing. And yes, it's a foreign invasion. And yes, he's a godly man, but he kind of panics. He goes, I thought we were doing everything right, and now these bad things are happening. Do bad things happen to good people? Yes. And this is a situation here where Hezekiah uh, very possibly thought that no matter how good he was, maybe Judah deserves this because of the things his father had done. It's possible he um, just didn't have the, you know, the strength. We know from Isaiah that Hezekiah started to reach out to Egypt for help. And Isaiah warned him not to do that. This is something. So basically, Hezekiah, as godly as he was, he panics. He messes up. He starts to look for help elsewhere. And in verse 14, he finally tracks down the king who's running the battle. And he's getting ready to take out Lachish, and he says, I've offended. 
return from me. Hezekiah just tracks down the king and says, I'm, I'm bad. I'm, the, I'm at fault here. I'm so sorry. Um, whatever tribute you need, I'll give it to you. Um, please don't keep conquering my cities. Um, I've offended. Return from me. Please, please stop doing this. Now, the previous kings in the north, you know, you come in, you threaten, and you demand tribute. Then if you pay the tribute, they let you go. It's like, a, you know, it's an insurance racket. You give me the money, I won't burn your place down. So now here, Hezekiah is saying, please, please stop burning my place down. Let me give you some tribute. He says, whatever you put on me, I will bear. So the king of Assyria, Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver, 30 talents of gold. He says, okay, I'll, I'll stop conquering. You give me some money. And pay me some tribute. So Hezekiah does this again. He's panicking. He, is he wrong? Yes. But we've all been wrong before. And this is an important part of this lesson tonight is realizing when when we react, when we screw up, when we just do things we shouldn't have done, the power and might and mercy of God is still available. Verse 15, Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king's house. And at that time, Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Jude, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. So he's, he's just handing everything over. He's, he's packing, basically. So this, this siege of Lakesh, which is where Hezekiah tracks him down, is actually a famous, um, it's a carving in the British Museum. And so everything is established here, verse 17. The king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lakesh to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. So what happens here, Hezekiah pays him off, and then the Syrian king decides, I'm going to take Jerusalem anyway. This is what happens when you pay off the, you know, you, you, you pay off the, the racketeer, and then they come, and they, they decide to take it anyway. So Hezekiah's plan of paying him off to save lives, paying him off to not conquer Jerusalem is failing. So we have a character here, uh, the name Rav Shaka, which is the top general. It's not an actual person's name. He's going to be the main character here. And this Rav Shaka and other military leaders come up to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. So they're now going to bring an army against Jerusalem. They're going to but a siege around Jerusalem is going to last for about a year. And, of course, siege warfare is the worst of the worst because you just surround the city and wait to starve the people out. Eventually, the people will, will um, surrender from starvation. <clears throat> so they're going to announce this. It says in verse 17 at the end of it, when they came up, when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool which is in the highway of the fuller's field. This army came, surrounded the city, and placed himself at the wall near the upper pool, which is the city's water supply. This is a, a statement of great um, uh, intimidation. Hi, we're the Assyrian army. You can't do anything to stop us. We have control of your water supply. We can poison you anytime we want to. And we got something to tell you. So, in verse 18. They called to the king, and there came out of them Elikim, the son of Hilkiah, which is over the household. So the Hezekiah's head of household came out, Shebna the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. So, um, Rabshakeh, the top general of the Syrian army, shows up and said, we have a message for Hezekiah. And, of course, naturally, the head of household, the top scribe, the reporters all come out. And they're having a conversation on the wall. 
And Rav Shaka said to them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah. Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein you trust? So the message, the message from king of Assyria to the king of Hezekiah is, What chance do you have? What sort of confidence do you have that you can handle my military? What confidence are you trusting in? He's going to get around to mocking God, but he's going to go through all the reasons why there's no hope. The purpose of this, this speech and this message is to get Hezekiah and get Jerusalem to surrender without a fight, just to give up. You say that they are vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. This is mocking. Rasheka is saying, you think you're tough. Now on whom do you trust that thou rebel against me? What chance do you have to, to fight me? Now behold, you trust upon the staff of this bruised reed, even Egypt, on which if a man lean, it would go into his hand. He's saying, I heard rumors that you were kind of reaching out that maybe Egypt could help you. Egypt is a country that is about ready to be destroyed as well. If you try to trust it as a walking stick, it's going to be like a weak reed. The only thing that's going to happen if you rest your hand on this reed is it'll poke a hole in your hand. It's a thin, sharp, pointy piece of grass. And just like Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to all that trust unto him, trusting in Egypt won't help you. And as I mentioned earlier, Isaiah has already told Hezekiah, don't trust in Egypt. And of course, in the law, trusting in Egypt was a sign of going back to the world, going back to uh, idolatry, going back to, um, to, uh, to subjugation under Pharaoh. Going back to Egypt has always been a picture in the Bible of returning to the world, returning to the flesh. Verse 22, but if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God. Say, is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah have taken away? And I said, in the Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Rab Shekha has an incorrect theology here. He's saying, you're trusting in the Lord your God. Well, I heard that Hezekiah took away all the high places. He says, I'm certain your God doesn't appreciate Hezekiah taking away all those different opportunities for worship. Rab Shekha thinks that God likes to be worshipped in all sorts of different places all over the mountain. So he is telling the people, Hezekiah took away all those worship places and is insisting he worship only in one place. So, make this clear. Rav Shekha thinks that Yahweh is going to be mad about that. Rav Shekha thinks that Yahweh is going to not bless Hezekiah because Hezekiah has removed worship places. Of course, Hezekiah has removed false worship places. Rav Shekha is wrong there. But picture Rav Shekha speaking like Satan speaks to us, trying to undermine us, trying to see, trying to tell us we did things wrong, trying to tell us we're not worthy. And we'll see all these different pictures as Rav Shekha continues talking. He says, you're going to worship in one place? Verse 23. Now, therefore, I pray you, give pledges to my Lord, the king of Assyria. And I will deliver you 2,000 horses. So he's mocking God. He's saying God doesn't like the way you worship. And now he's saying, um, if you give me some money, if you give us the tribute like you're supposed to, he says, I'll give you 2,000 horses. This is mockery. He's saying, even if I gave you 2,000 horses, you still wouldn't stand a chance. Even if you had 2,000 horses and the men to ride them that were trained and could fight militarily, they still wouldn't have a chance against us. <clears throat> As a result, verse 24, how then will you turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants? You couldn't, you know, one of, one of my charioteers could take you out. You couldn't turn away one of my men, at least, all, at least away all of them. And you put your trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? And I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it. This is the next thing he's going to be saying. He's saying, I want to point out to you that if your God's so powerful, 
he obviously has allowed me to get this far. He's not as tough as you think he is. He says, you might think your God is tough, but guess what? I'm here, aren't I? He's saying, I came up without the Lord against this place to destroy that. The Lord didn't stop me this far. The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy. Matter of fact, he said, I'll bet you, your God told me to do this. Again, can Satan speak for God sometimes falsely? Well, God said this. Uh, a little clue here. If someone comes up to you and says, God told me to tell you this, probably about a 98% chance they're lying, okay? We don't listen to people when some people say, God told me this, God told me that. Okay, does it happen sometimes? Yes. Do we wait for independent witnesses? Absolutely. And do we, you know, we respond and allow God to speak through other people? No question. But when someone starts a conversation out with, you know, God told me to tell you to trust me. You know, that's, you generally want to run. <clears throat> and here this guy said, the Lord told me, go up against this land and destroy it. So Rob Shaka is speaking to these leaders, but he's speaking to them on the wall and he's doing it publicly. So verse 26, then said Elakim, son of Philkai, and Shebna and Joan unto Rob Shaka. So Rob Shaka says his piece, makes his mockery, says his, 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 his taunt and his declaration. And their response is this. Speak, I pray, to the servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it. What they're saying is, okay, you're talking all this stuff, but you're speaking Hebrew, and everybody can understand you. Could you please, please speak Aramaic? Can you speak uh, in the Syrian language so that the people on the wall can't overhear what we're talking about? In other words, can you make this meeting a little more secret? And he says, please speak in the Assyrian language, for we understand it, and talk not with us in the Jewish language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. <clears throat> so you can imagine the response to this. Just picture it. Um, Rav Shek is talking tough, and they say, oh, please, 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 can you, can you use your other language so people can't hear what you're saying? And of course, Rav Shek says, oh, what is Rav Shekha's objective? Intimidation, fear, terror. So when he's told, please don't use the language of the everyday people, Rav Shekha says, oh, this is great. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, one of the problems when you start dialoguing with Satan, all of a sudden, it goes from bad to worse. <clears throat> so Rav Shekha then, verse 27, says, oh, Oh, now that you pointed out that everybody can understand what I'm saying, I'm going to keep talking even worse. R Rav Shaka now speaks to the crowds on the wall. He says, has my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? He says, um, I've been told to speak these words, and you're going to listen to them. Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall? He says, my king sent me to talk to everybody. I'm talking to everybody. I'm so glad you can understand me. And he says, I got something to tell you. All of you sitting on the wall, you can understand me. He said, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to eat your own dung and drink your own piss. That's what he says. So when you tell the bad guy, please be considerate. Don't, you know, you're going to hurt some feelings. Can you use a different language? The bad guy is going to say, oh, now that you pointed out that they all understand me, let me talk in a language that I'll understand clearly. So, Rav Shekha is in, enjoying this. He's saying, oh, that's right. I can make everybody feel even worse. Rav Shekha then stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews language and spake and said, hear the word of the great king and the king of Assyria. <clears throat> hear this word. He's got everybody's attention. And again, what's his purpose? To get them to surrender. You don't have a chance. There's no point in fighting. Just go ahead and surrender. We can take out your water supply anytime we want to. Um, we have plans for you. If you fight, you're going to be eating your own refuge. Verse 29. Thus says the king of Assyria, let not Hezekiah deceive you. Your king's deceiving you. Has Satan never told you that your king's deceiving you? Has Satan ever told you that God doesn't really understand what's going on or that God's plan isn't, isn't 
really what's best for you. <clears throat> and again, Hezekiah is in bigger and bigger and bigger trouble. Something bad happened. He kind of reached out to Egypt. Not, not as obviously as the Northern Kingdom, but he hasn't turned to God. And, and he should have. Verse 30, Rabshakeh continues, Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and the city shall not be delivered unto the hand of the king of Assyria. Don't let Hezekiah fool you. If Hezekiah says God can deliver you, well, he's lying. Because God can. Don't listen to Hezekiah, verse 31. For thus says the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present. In other words, give me some tribute. If you give me the money and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his cistern. If you surrender and just open up the city gates and come walking out of the city gates, I'll make sure everybody has their own wine, everybody has their own fig tree, everybody has their own water. I promise I'll take good care of you. Once again, the world loves to make promises to take care of you. Um, if they came out right at this point, do you think Rob Sheku would, would honor that? Obviously not. He's going to do what the Assyrians did, put folks in their cheeks and drag them off to captivity. He says, I'll do that. Verse 32. I'm going to give you all these things, and then after I've made sure you're all taken care of, verse 32, I will come and take you away to a land just like your own land. A land of corn and wine, a land of red and vineyards, a land of oil, olive, and of honey, that you may live and not die. So he's saying, yeah, I know the Assyrians, when they take captive, they take them to other countries, but we'll take you to a good country. We'll take you away from this land and take you to a place full of olive trees and vineyards and good bread. Now remember, these people have been on the verge of starving. They've been under siege for a while. They can't get outside to plant their crops. <clears throat> So they're surviving in whatever is they plant on the inside and whatever is in storage. So this could sound kind of sound good. But once again, this is obviously lies. He says, you will not die. He says, hearken not unto Hezekiah. This is the end of verse 32. When he persuades you, saying the Lord will deliver us. So Rav Shaka here, general, top general, is he's mocking God. Verse 33, have any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his lands out of the hands of the king of Assyria? He's like, we got history. Every other country we have conquered, their gods didn't help them. What makes you think your god's special? Also a reminder that the god of the northern kingdom doesn't seem to have helped them either. Of course, they're worshiping um, golden calves. Verse 34, where are the gods of Hamath? And of Arphad, when the gods of Sepharvam, Hena, and Eva. This list of nations of other countries that they've conquered, uh, for the most part, matches the list of people that were brought in to repopulate the northern part of the kingdom when the Jews were taken out by the previous king. So this is what Assyrians do. They would conquer lands and they would take the people, scatter them into previous conquered lands, their idea was to divide and conquer, destroy ethnic, destroy um, uh, people's heritages. <clears throat> it says, who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. He's saying, your God is no better than all the other gods that failed. This is the final blasphemy of Rav Shekha here. So he's demanding an answer of the people here. But this is probably the first good thing that Hezekiah does and the people do. Verse 36, the people held their peace, answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was saying, answer him not. So finally they do the right thing. Silence. You don't, you don't answer. You don't debate Satan. You don't get into an argument. You don't try to present logic to him. There's just nothing there. So here's the picture. Hezekiah is in horrible, horrible state. 
tried to buy him off. It didn't quite work off. Now they come back. And, I mean, he's been betrayed every step of the way. Let's face it. When the people who have always lied to you come to you and say, now believe me, you're probably in a big problem. You know, I know all, everything I said, all the past 10 things I said were lies, but this time, if you come out, we'll treat you nice. It came to pass when King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes, covered himself with a sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. This is it. It cannot get worse. This is the end. He goes in the house of the Lord. Nothing has worked. He tried to hold off a little bit. And, and this, this, is, this is you and me. This is me when I've just totally, totally failed. I just, I, I botched it up. I did things backwards. I got things all messed up. And now the worst of the worst is here. And he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. So everything's gone wrong. Everything's gone bad. I'm going to go. I'm taking this to Isaiah, <clears throat> to the man of God. This is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And they said unto him, to Isaiah, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy. For the children are come to birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. He's saying, Everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. The country is getting ready to die. We're, go we're going under. And this phrase, the children are come to birth and it's not strength. This is a picture of a woman who's ready to give birth, but she doesn't have strength to do it. And as a result, both the baby and the mother are going to die. This is a worst case scenario. And he's saying, we we've got nothing. We have no, no hope, no help. And so the, the message that Hezekiah sends to Isaiah is this. And verse 4, And maybe the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to report to the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that are left. So this is Hezekiah, First Peter 4. 5 7 cast all your care upon him for he cares for you <clears throat> he, he, um, he, he tells this to Isaiah and he's this is one of those prayers like Moses he said maybe God paid attention to the blasphemy of the Rabshakeh maybe God will respond to uh, the dishonoring of his name and God will honor his name and, and respond that way. It's not a prayer, please rescue us because we deserve it. It's a prayer, of God, we, we don't deserve it, but please rescue us anyway for your name's sake. So in verse 6, Isaiah said to them, this is God's response, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus saith the, say the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which you have heard, but the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. This is God's response. Don't be afraid of words. And I think that's a very beautiful, comforting thing. So far, Rabbi Shek has just said words. Don't be afraid of words. And this phrase right here, it says, which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. The word servant here in the Hebrew means lackeys or errand boys. God is um, minimizing this whole thing. He's saying, don't be afraid of the words that the little errand boys said to you. This is not a big thing in the eyes of God. Behold, I will send a blast upon him. Well, that's your answer right there. I'm going to send a blast upon him. He shall hear a rumor and shall return to his own land. And I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So we have three things here. Number one is a blast. Number two is a rumor. And number three is that um, the king of Assyria will fall by his by the by the sword in his own land. There are three things here, blast, rumor, and fall by the sword. These three things do happen. They do not happen in this order. But that message gets back to that. So verse 8. So Rav Shekhar returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. 
So that's exactly, the rumor happens first. We have a rumor here that um, there's another war going on. Matter of fact, the rumor is that um, uh, the Ethiopian, an Ethiopian king is working with Egypt to attack Assyria elsewhere. And so the, the entire troops, it's not spelled out clearly here, but what happens is that Rabshaka and all his troops, they just leave. They just, they just go away. They found that there was a Syrian warring against Lebanon, and he had heard he departed from Lachish. And he heard say of Takara, king of Ethiopia, Behold, he has come out to fight against the, he sent messengers again under Hezekiah, saying, So, Rabshaka and the troops, they leave. And after they leave, the reason they leave is we have this, um, the Assyrians learn that the Egyptian troops under an Ethiopian king were advancing from the south. That's the rumor. They all leave, they take care of it, find out that it's kind of unfounded. But what happens is that <clears throat> they, they send another messenger to Hezekiah. They send a message to Hezekiah. So the picture is this. Sits under siege, all of a sudden they pray, and the Syrian army just vanishes. They just they just go away, they disappear. And so the rumor has happened, they've disappeared, but they send a message to Hezekiah. Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not the God in whom you trust deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hands of the king of Assyria. In other words, I know we left, but don't think that means this is over. I know we left, but don't think this means that your God delivered you, because your God will not deliver you. We'll be back, and when we come back, we'll finish what we started. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? So, <clears throat> again, the picture here is, Rabshakeh talks trash, the siege is ongoing, people are preparing for a, a long starvation. All of a sudden, all the armies leave. They run off, and that's the rumor. But after they run off, they send a letter back, and the letter here is, we're coming back. Don't think you got a break. Don't think your God delivered you. Now, question, did God deliver them? Yes. What is Satan saying? God did not deliver you. It, it may look good for a season, but but we're, we'll be back. So it's the same taunts. Verse 11, you heard what the kings of Assyria have done to other lands by destroying them utterly. Verse 12, have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan, Haran, Respa, and the children of Eden, which were in Thalassar. So again, he's, re he's continuing on with his resume. These are all the countries that Assyria has destroyed, and you're no better. Where is the king of Hamath, and the king of Arpad, and the king of the city of Servaim, and Hena, and Eva? All those kings that thought they could handle us, they're gone, and you're next. So, <clears throat> Hezekiah has received a brief reprieve. And again, he's very conflicted. Do we deserve punishment because of what father did? Um, all these things happen. I didn't expect it. I probably shouldn't have gone to Egypt. Isaiah told me not to. I really, really, really messed up. I went to God and he delivered me. It was a miracle. Everything, everything looks good, but here it is again. This is that, that haunting feeling you have when, you know, <clears throat> everything's fine until your house gets broken into or you get mugged, right? After you get mugged, then you're, you're, you're shell-shocked. And now, yeah, correct. maybe the mugger left, but now you're afraid to walk the street. And Hezekiah is like, when's the next shoe going to drop? And then this letter shows up. <clears throat> Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Now, this is the second time Hezekiah's dealt with the letter. I want you to notice the progress here. The first letter, he rushed in and 
and sent a message to Isaiah, to the man of God. Was that the right thing to do? Absolutely. Was it good? Yes. But now he's progressed. He's taken it directly to God himself. He's not usurping the office of priest. But what he's doing is learning what we all learned, what the disciples had to learn. The disciples had to learn that God was with them, whether Jesus was physically there or not. Yo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Jesus had to train them that he was going to send the Holy Spirit and that when the Holy Spirit had come upon them, they would be just as with God as when Jesus was standing there next to them. It's no difference. Jesus is permanently with us, whether he's there physically or not. And this is what Hezekiah has now learned. <clears throat> he takes this letter and spreads it before the Lord. Isn't that a great lesson? You get bad news, you take the bad news, the newspaper, the, the letter, the nasty letter someone wrote you, take your um your bills, <clears throat> take your the letter that told that the job you have for 30 years, you've been let go. Take that letter, just spread it out in front of the guy and say, Guy, would you read this, please? I think that's a beautiful picture. Does God need to read it? No. God knows what's in it. But you're sharing with God. He went before the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. This is one of the, a very beautiful prayer here. He prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwells between the cherubims. What is he saying? He's pointing out that God is a God of mercy. This is where Moses met God, between the cherubim. The cherubim were the, the cherubim, the angels on top of the Ark of the Covenant, onto the mercy seat. Hezekiah is going there and saying, this letter is another kick in the stomach, God, but I'm bringing it before you and I'm taking it to the mercy seat. I deserve nothing. For it dwells between the cherubs. You are God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. This is Hezekiah acknowledging God's sovereignty. You're not just the king of Judah, you're the king of Assyria. You're the king of the planet. You're the king of the universe. You are the one that allows things to happen. You're the one that's in control. You made heaven and earth. Lord, please bow down your ear and hear. Listen to me. Open, Lord, your eyes and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which has sent him to reproach the living God. Remember when David talked back to Goliath? He said, you're cursing the living God. How dare you? This prayer includes a recognition of God's sovereignty in verse 15. It mentions the Assyrian's defiance, a request for deliverance. He's recognizing that God is a spirit not a piece of wood or stone. In verse 18, he says, they have cast their gods into the fire. In other words, they made molten and graven gods. For they were no gods, but the works of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they have destroyed them. Wherefore, therefore, O Lord, our God, I beseech thee. Hezekiah is pointing out, realizing, or just confessing that when Sennacherib brags about having to feed all those other gods, well, those gods were man-made gods. They weren't the living God. Therefore, in this prayer, Hezekiah, when you pray, you start to gain strength because you start to get God's perspective on things. Hezekiah is praying, and as he's praying, he's going, wait a minute. Sennacherib just talked trash against the living God. Uh, he might be in trouble. And he continues in this vein. He says, now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us. Please save us out of his hands. That all the kings of the earth may know that you are the Lord God and you only. In other words, there's not a list of gods that are all fighting for attention. There's not a list of gods that, that Sennacherib, you know, has, has been knocking down. They're all meaningless. They're all worthless. There's only one God. So Hezekiah prays this prayer. The objective of this prayer is God's glory, not just his survival. He wants God to vindicate himself, vindicate God. And 
to show the world that he's not an impotent idol. So this is key. Hezekiah prays the prayer, and then Isaiah brings the answer. No record of Hezekiah talking to Isaiah. Verse 20, Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, That which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. Isaiah shows up, knock, knock, knock. Hey, God heard your prayer. Isn't that a beautiful picture there? Isaiah shows up. And this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. This is the answer to the prayer. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you and laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at thee. So this is God's word to the king of Assyria. He said, okay, you sent Hezekiah a letter. I'm going to send you a message back. No real record that the king of Assyria got this message, but this is the message that <clears throat> was given to Hezekiah. This is God's response to the king of Assyria's words. Virgin daughter of Zion. Who is that? That's Jerusalem. Why would God be calling Jerusalem? Jerusalem virgin at this time. Well, she was at this point unluted by the idolatry of the pagans. You know, Athelia had tried to do a little bit in Jerusalem and that had been taken care of. Um, God can defend Jerusalem from this attack by Sennacherib and the Assyrians. And of course, Jerusalem had never been conquered since David acquired control from the Jebusites. So this is a, at this point, untouched city. So God's response to the king of Assyria is that you can't touch Jerusalem. Not going to happen. Verse 22. Who have you reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast you exalted your voice, lifted upon your eyes on high? Even the Holy One of Israel. Who are you talking against? Who are you attacking? The Lord God. By your messengers, you have reproached the Lord and has said, with the multitude of chariots, I come up to the height of the mountains, to the side of Lebanon, and will cut down the tall cedar trees thereof, and the choice fir trees thereof, and I will enter into the lodges of his border, into the forest of his Carmel. Not Carmel. So this is the bragging that the king has done. <clears throat> the breaks I have digged and drunk strange waters. I've conquered great, many, many nations. With the soles of my feet, I have dried up all the rivers of the besieged places. In other words, you brag about going into all these different areas and taking control of them. Now, an interesting thing, one of the brags that the, um, the journal had said was, well, that the, 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 he said the king of Assyria said was, God told me to do it. Well, that was a lie. But in a weird way, what it's going to point out here is God's always in control. So we had verse 22 to 24. God is saying, you great king of Assyria, you brag about all your great accomplishments, all your great successes. This could be even Satan bragging about how much destruction he's wrought on the world. Verse 25. Have you not heard long ago how I have done it? God is saying, excuse me, I'm the one in charge here. You might think you destroyed all these nations. You might think you destroyed all these lives. You might just think that you had some control, but you didn't. I have done it, and of ancient times I have formed it. Now I have brought it to pass, that thou shouldst be, shouldst be, be to lay waste fenced cities under ruinous heaps. <clears throat> so God is saying... Whatever success you had, I allowed it to happen. In other words, you're a nobody. <clears throat> Therefore, their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. You thought you won because you were great. No, you won because they were nothing. You know, you can't brag about conquering a, an anthill because anthills are easy to conquer. You just run your, you just run your SUV over it. You're a nobody. They were dismayed and confounded. There is the grass in the field and as the green herb, as the grass in the housetops, and as corn blossoms before it is growing up. Your victories were easy because you had 
insignificant um, adversaries. But I know your abode, and you're going out, and you're coming in, and you rage against me. <clears throat> because your rage against me and your tumult has come up to my ears, therefore I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way by which you came. So this is everything that God is telling um, Isaiah. And Isaiah is telling this to Hezekiah. And telling Hezekiah, this is God's response to the king of Assyria. Again, no record that the king of Assyria got this message, but he's telling Hezekiah, this is what's going to happen to the king of Assyria. In other words, you have nothing to worry about. And this is a sign unto you, verse 29. This is a cool little sign here. You shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves. Then the second year, that's which spring up of the same. And the third year, you will sow and reap. So what he's saying, here's, here's how it's going to play out. You've been under siege for about a year. In other words, you've been living on rations and you're getting pretty, pretty hungry. He said, here's a sign. Outside of the city, there's plants growing wild. You have not been able to grow your crops. You haven't been able to plant your crops. You can't be able to do proper agriculture at all. However, next year that comes around, You'll be free to go out in or out of the city because they'll be gone. You know, all your freedom will be restored to you. The Assyrians will be gone. There'll be history. But since you couldn't plant your crops, I'm going to make sure you have plenty of food anyway. So this is reminiscent of when they first got to the promised land. They couldn't eat for the first, they couldn't eat of their own crops for the first couple of years. And God sustained them on just giving them bumper wild crops. So it says, so this coming year, you'll have wild crops to sustain you. I'm going to give you a second year as well. A second year of just unbelievable growth that you didn't plant, that you didn't, um, you didn't sow, but you'll be free to harvest. And after that, on the third year, then you'll, you'll, you'll be expected to go back and start doing your own work again. <clears throat> you'll, you'll be able to reap, plant vineyards, and eat the fruits thereof. So... All the crops that you couldn't grow, I'm going to replenish them, and you'll, you'll have plenty of fruit. And verse 30, here's another sign. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall so yet, yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Um, in, in history, Sennacherib claimed to have taken 200,000, 200,150. That was his historical claim of the captures he's taken from, from Judah. And what this is saying is that, yes, maybe he captured that many, but I'm going to give you great growth. I'm going to rejuvenate your uh, offspring. I'm going to replace the people that are there. And um, I mean, 200,000 is a lot of people. And so they, what God is telling Hezekiah, you may think you've lost people through attrition, but no, I'm going to restore that and rebuild all that they've taken. Therefore, for verse 31, for out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. The Lord of hosts. This is God calling himself the Lord of the armies. So he's telling Hezekiah, everything's going to be fine. The Lord of hosts is going to take over now. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with a shield, nor cast a bank against it. So, God is making a promise. There will not be one arrow shot from an Assyrian. Whatever happens, if the armies come, whatever's coming along, and that's quite a promise to make, right? Because if the Assyrian army comes back, you know, all it takes is one soldier to shoot an arrow. And, whoop, no, God's promise wasn't true after all. But he's making a promise here. No banks. A bank here is the, the earth embankment that seals off the siege there. And by the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into the city. If I would defend the city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. <clears throat> so Hezekiah, you have nothing to fear. It's just a letter. So what has happened here 
is the Assyrians do show up and they come and they surround the city. And it came to pass that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred, four score, and five thousand. So 100, 185,000 Assyrian men, when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So the Assyrian army does come back and they get ready to, to, see, to seize the city. And there are historical records. It's, Assyrian history doesn't talk about this. They, they, don't, they, they talk about the conquest, the successes they have. But there's some Egyptian that talks about some sort of death that's spread through it, like a bubonic plague. Um, there's stories of infestation of mice that ran through the camps and ate all the leather and all of their gear and spread plague. Of course, whether... Obviously, the Bible says an angel is always an angel. We're not trying to minimize that or try to secularize or de-supernaturalize it. But um, <clears throat> should it have been some sort of disease, the fact that it happened at this point in time is still the miracle. An angel did this. So angels, the not cute things that sit on top of your Christmas tree. These are tough. There's one angel took out 185,000 Assyrians. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. The phrase dwelt at Nineveh means no more expansion. No more, for the rest of the Assyrian Empire, this is the decline of the Assyrian Empire. The Babylonian Empire came after this. It came to pass, verse 37. Between verse 36 and 37, about 20 years. So we had the rumor, the blast was 185,000 Assyrian military men dying in one night. And now we have the fact that the king of Assyria is going to be killed in his own country at the hands, in this case, of his son. Verse 37, it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that Adramelech and Shehaz of his son smote him with the sword. And they escaped into the land of Armenia. And Esther and on his son, reigned in his stead. So all the prophecies came true. This is um, Sennacherib worshiping in his God's temple, and his God could not protect him. This is the temple in Nineveh. He falls to this plot of his assassins, two of his own sons. And they fled to Arme Armenia right now. is about 300 miles north of Nineveh. Armenia has regions in Russia, Turkey, and Iran. What's the point of this whole message? Hezekiah messes up big time, and God still delivers. And God is always available. Hezekiah comes before God, puts a letter in front of him and says, I am helpless. I am hopeless. And God says, for my name's sake, I will rescue you. And everything is restored. It's a very powerful, beautiful piece. Realizing that nothing's too big for God. Nothing's too tough for God. And God was always in control from the beginning to the end. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for the confidence we have in you. Thank you for the, the beauty that comes from resting in you and realizing it's never too late. So God, just bless us as we go our ways. Keep us safe. We pray for continued health. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't notice the time there. Apologize. So. Are the Jebusites are they still in existence or I no. mean, what? Pardon Jeb me. Jebusites were were original Canaanites. <clears throat> original Canaanites. No, there, there's no Canaanites at all. No Philistines either. <laughs> okay. In case you're wondering, just... Palestinians are just Arabs. Oh, Palestinians okay. were Crete, were like were brought were from Crete, like the Greek. Because I mean, when they had Jerusalem hadn't been conquered since David, and then you know, I'm just wondering how they can say that you know it was their land first, um, whoever it was. Okay, and I, it was their land. God took it from them and gave it to Israel. Right. No, but he had given them 400 years to 
to repent. We've talked about that. The Amorites is a generic term for all the Canaanites. Philistines were not Canaanites. He gave them the lecture time. <clears throat> um, but yeah, the Jebusites, um, they, they attacked, I, I forget the original name of Jerusalem. I apologize. Stuart probably knows it. Um, but um, they attacked a couple of times. Jebusites held on to it, but eventually David, he, he cleansed the place and took care of that. You know, any any Canaanites, if there were anybody with Canaanite ancestry today, it would be because they became Jews. <laughs> you know, you you have the Gibeonites who were servants in the temple, and they came back with Ezra, the Nehelam, I forgot the name. Yeah, John, that's correct. The Gibeonites are the only Canaanites that would still be in existence, but they would be intermixed in the Jewish blood. Yeah, and the, the, the Nephilim, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm thinking of. I was trying not to say Nephilim, that's something different. Nothing. Mm -hmm. so. I, I just hope that people, when you when you read through this story, this should speak to anyone that is just completely despairing because they screwed up big time. You know, you know, grace grace is for the guilty, and sometimes just realizing you're the guilty one is the fresh air. It is okay. Phew. Now I can I can process that. <clears throat> So we sent over the, from the U.S. over to the Middle East, one of those, I guess, subs that's getting close. They're really expecting, I guess, an attack from, yeah. from all over. Yeah, for anyone listening to this uh, recording at a later date, this is um, the eve of a lot of people might think where Iran is threatening to attack Israel right now. So we're recording it on August 12, 24. So yeah, there's a lot of um, praying for the peace of Jerusalem, waiting to see how God's going to use all of this. Yeah. And um, I, I can't see any direction but escalation. And I'm not sure whether, which it's hard to say which is the best thing at this point, you know. Everybody wants to get it over with. <laughs> well, I know there's three U.S. battle fleets over there now on the carrier fleets. Mm -hmm. One in the Mediterranean right there, one in the Persian Gulf, and one there in the Red Sea. All all right there. Yeah. There's no one other. The sad thing this time around is it just feels like we don't have Israel's back like we've had it in the past. And I still remember being very moved and proud with all the Scud missiles and the Patriot missiles and stuff um, during the Gulf War. You know, we did what we had to do, but then when, when we were told, if you do this, we're going to attack Israel, just as a totally secondary attack. And we said, well, fine, we'll take care of that. Yeah. And I hate to jump to conclude or jump into prophecy type conclusions, but I'm still starting to wonder <clears throat> how some of this might morph into the Ezekiel War. The only real missing piece is it seems like Russia is, um, is uh, distracted elsewhere right now. What's really funny is Ukraine has now taken over some 300 square miles of Russian territory. <laughs> it's kind of weird. It's, it's almost like Russia would say, I'm going to give up on that war and let's go down south. 
find some better allies. I don't know. It's going to be amazing in retrospect to see how all this will fit together. Yeah. Hmm. Now, if you're in northern Israel right now, I mean, you have your schools, your high schools, and your theaters and your playgrounds, and 100 feet away on the other side of fences is Hezbollah. Yeah. People are all, they're, lot, they're all in shelters right now. Yeah, as my mother used to say, it's trying times, trying times. Yeah. And it will get worse. Uh, yeah, know. some of it has to. You know, these things must be. But remember, Hezekiah's prayer. That's something to really go back and kind of study the prayer. One of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible is just acknowledging God's sovereignty, acknowledging the need for mercy, and reminding God that his glory is on the line. It's not wrong to do that. God appreciated Moses when he did it. Says God, if you wipe us out, the Egyptians are going to make fun of you. <laughs> so he'll say you couldn't take care of them in the desert, so you killed them. So, yeah, we, we do have a promise that Israel will not be destroyed. You know, it's sometimes he has some people trying to raise money because if we don't do this, this will be destroyed. No, this is gonna be fine. I just it's don't want to, I don't want to be part of the group that stands by and doesn't care. That's all. Doesn't doesn't support. Go ahead, Judy. It's, it's not going to be destroyed, but it's going to be damaged. Is that what I'm hearing? I mean, I mean, it's it's, it's never going to be destroyed again. Um, at the end of the tribulation period, the Antichrist is going to try to destroy it. It's going to kill about a third okay. and scatter another third. And right. yeah, there's going to be attempts to, but Israel, Israel will never be displaced again. Put it that way. It's never going to be scattered again. It's because in Isaiah 11 talks about after you return the second time, you'll never return again. You know, it's spelled out. There's two times, two returns. And the second return is 1948. <laughs> Leading up to that. <clears throat> so it's so important to have a biblical worldview. You have God's eye, God's eye view on things. You see the big picture. You understand that Jesus is the beginning and the end, and knows the end from the beginning, and Alpha and the Omega. And um, we are in the middle of it, and we see little glimpses, and we're kind of riding along. We try to figure out certain little things here and there, but <clears throat> not really for us to put the pieces together. We we enjoy watching God put them together. And we'll probably spend most of eternity being continually amazed by it. Have you run into this uh, belief that 1948 was simply a government thing and it wasn't God bringing the Israelites back and it, it doesn't count biblically? Sure. What do you think? Most of that, believe it or not, comes from Orthodox Jews. Orthodox Jews, they say that was a man-made thing. We want to wait for God to do it. Yeah, that's... You'll I, also I'm find, to put that together with what we believe. It doesn't fit. No. Um, How do you put first it? of all, when you, when you study the, um, the, 70, years, well, the, the 70 years of Daniel, 
and you study the, um, or this way, you have 70 years that Jeremiah, there's a 70 year for the nation to be destroyed and hand over the nations, and then a separate 70 years of Jerusalem be destroyed. And the city and the nation, two separate things. There's two windows that start 15 years apart. And when you multiply that by seven a couple times, there's reasons to do that for them not returning like they're supposed to. You have prophecy that the exact date, 1948, when they become a nation again, happens on that date. 15 years later, they're on the right date. Jerusalem becomes there again in the Six Day War. So, just if God decides to use the United Nations, it doesn't make it less God. Yeah, we find that really when God performs miracles, most of the time he does it through individuals or nations or so on. And that's coincidences are really God working behind the scenes. Well, just like uh, Babylon conquer, coming in as we're going to come into it with Jerusalem and take them away. You know, yeah. he, he uses other governments to form what he wants. Even though the devil thinks he's got, he owns the nations or owns the nations. You know, sometimes some of this thinking falls into the category of I don't want to see a doctor. I want God to heal me. Right. You know, just like, yeah. uh, what's, what's the story about, is there's a big flood coming along, right? And the water is rising and rising and then it gets up and the streets are flooded. And a guy comes by on a boat and says, come on, come along. Says, no, no, God will take care of me. And then it gets up higher and higher and then he gets to the second floor. And another boat comes by and the guy says, come on, we'll take you to safety. He says, no, God will take care of me. And then he gets up, and all of a sudden, he's up on the roof. Helicopter comes by, and a rope comes down, and he says, here, we can save you. The guy says, no, no, I'll wait for God to save me. And then the water rises, and he drowns. He goes to heaven and says, God, I thought you were going to save me. And I sent you two boats and a helicopter. What more do you want? <laughs> you know, it's trying to say God can do it how he wants to. So, yeah, and there's, there's some reform um, theologians that dismiss all restoration of Israel and just say that's just a, you know, historical event. There's no significance at all. There's nothing special about the land of Israel. It's just, it's just a chunk of geography like any place else. Which means you have to ignore everything God ever said about Israel, including the fact that he owns it and he leases it out to his people. Well, any other thoughts? I hope that story wasn't too sobering. Hopefully it was at least encouraging in some way. What, the guy in the helicopter and so on? Yeah, that's him. No, I'm talking about Hezekiah. <laughs> but there's more Hezekiah coming, by the way. He, he's a couple of the dumb things. Yeah, he does. But, um, <clears throat> Showing them all as... Uh... Yeah, this makes us all part of the happy human race. Well, I've always enjoyed that story where he took that letter and, and laid it out for yeah. God's repeat. Yeah. To me, that's, it's very significant what we need to do with our problems. Yeah, I just, it's... Hezekiah is a picture of each of us in our ways of trying and stumbling and God, his grace and mercy to, to help us out. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> And as of the one, maybe only two times that God has actually utilized one of the heavenly hosts to do the actual deed. The first one was a, you know, first one was an angel over the, over in Egypt mm -hmm. on there, and this was the second one. You know, used an angel of the Lord to do it. 
<clears throat> yes, I mean, it's just so easy to conclude that a situation is impossible. But of course, the impossible is what God deals with. I'm going to say it. God likes to stack the deck against himself. Mm -hmm. God help me. No, it's too easy. If I held you now, you might think you did it. <laughs> well, it's like he can uh, scramble the Rubik's Cube and get it back together and then snap. Yeah. Yep. You know? <clears throat> well, we serve an awesome God. We serve a very sovereign God. And we serve a God that no end from the beginning is, and we are we are in the middle of his plan. His plan is big and vast, but it's also unique and personal, and very individual. And I think that's something we can just celebrate and rest in, and say thank you. Everything is for my sake. Everything is for the kingdom's sake, and everything is for the glory of God. So. Stuart, would you go ahead and close in some prayers? Sure. Lord, thank you for this study of Hezekiah. We uh, see that he saw the wisdom in coming to you and following the commands of showing you and, and talking to you to be the one who can solve all of the problems that they were having at the time. We ask that you do the same for us. Lead us to, the, to you to prepare and to share what we need to do to you so that you can bless us the way you blessed him we ask all these things in thy name amen amen, amen. okay well thank you all we'll see you all next time thank you yeah good night good night everyone good night good night, good night. Good night. have a blessed week bye-bye okay.